there's shots being fired. That's affirmative. We have confirmation that 15 children have been shot. Cleveland Elementary School, 1989, the playground of one of America's first school shootings. We got a call for a man with a gun. So we didn't have a protocol for active shooter response. In fact, the term had not even been coined yet, active shooter. We've got children scattered all over the school. We haven't even got a bearing on where all these children are. We had no supplies. There was nothing to stop the bleeding with, except our hands. More than 30 years later, as I approached one of the portables on the corner, I, I heard a gunshot. Survivors are coming together to share their stories on this playground. It, it robbed me of that innocence of being invincible, because I had friends that were killed that day. So I do have PTSD and panic disorder. From the playground to the national battleground, guns have left our country divided, creating a new generation of school safety. It's one of the nation's worst school shootings of its time. In 1989, five students were shot and killed at Stockton's Cleveland Elementary School. Many people thought that they would never see another school shooting like this again, but unfortunately, it's a relived reality. Some of the images you're about to see may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. It was shortly before noon, and the playground at Stockton's Cleveland Elementary School looked like a battlefield after a bloody war. It's like a machine gun, and me and my friend Nicole were just panicking. We're the only ones that were crying. I'm looking for looking my daughter, <laughs> Joanna Ma. This is terrible. My worst nightmare. I just heard the gunshots, and then I looked, and I saw my friend laying down on the ground. Get my nobody. Police searched for a reason knowing they may never find out why the suspect turned this playground into a war zone. For the first time, shooting survivors are revisiting the school together. This is where all the parents came to try to find their kids. What I remember was that there were 50, 60 ambulance, firefighter engines and, and, and uh, police cars here. And my, we were my all blocked. My ambulance was right here. My classroom's right there, that door. I was at the chalkboard and I had just stepped back to view my work. The bullets came through the wall and landed at my feet, at which point I yelled to the morning teacher to run. When the door opened, a former student that I had in kindergarten, she came running in and said, he killed Twee and now he's gonna kill me. We opened the doors and there were kids coming through the hallway right outside our room, and they were racing, but some of the kids would get partway into the hallway and fall because they had been shot. Then I run, then my friend run too, then they shoot me, then I fall, then I get up. During recess, a gunman set his car on fire with a Molotov cocktail. He walked onto campus where 300 first, second, and third graders were playing. He fired more than 100 rounds with an assault rifle within a minute. I was six and a half, I was in first grade at the time, and my mom walked me to, to school, and then she walked me up to the back gate, and she gave me a hug and a kiss on my cheek and told me to have a good day. Well, unbeknownst to me, that's the same uh, gate that the gunman would end up walking through when the gunfire erupted. I knew everybody was running and screaming, and that alone was terrifying. I took off running in classroom 20. That was the classroom that I had to get to. And I turned to see where my best friend Scotty was. And uh, when I turned around, that's when I got hit. And that's when the round went through my, my right foot. Uh, I landed on the ground and another round struck me in my chest. It hit the pavement right before it went into my chest. And I look up and we had a substitute teacher that morning and she had the door opened up. I took off running, kind of hobbling. Bullets were coming through the wall and she was just telling us to get down under our desks. It was the scream of sirens that first alerted many parents that something desperately was wrong. In 1989, I was actually finishing up the last month of my paramedic ambulance career. We got a call for a man with a gun at Cleveland Elementary. So we didn't have a protocol for active shooter response. In fact, the term had not even been coined yet active shooter. The first units to arrive found mass confusion and widespread carnage. Ten, uh, ten, two more engines. Uh, we've got children scattered all over the school. Uh, 
some fatalities, some injured, and right now we haven't even got a bearing on where all these children are. As we started walking down some of the hallways, you could see the blood trails of the kids who had been shot, and it would like literally lead to a cupboard. And then we would open the cupboard and there would be a child there. I had been trained, very seriously trained in first aid, but we had no supplies. There was nothing to stop the bleeding with, except our hands. I came to about this point near the corner of this one portable, and I heard a single gunshot. I walked around to this location where I encountered the shooter, Patrick Purdy, who had um, shot himself in the head. The shooter was 24-year-old Patrick Purdy, a former student of Stockton Elementary School. His gun was laying next to him. I eventually went back to that side and continued to treat a number of different students, including one of the teachers who was badly wounded and who had to be flown out by helicopter. I shouted for the kids to drop because I was by the playground apparatus and I thought the boards would protect some of them until I saw too many kids literally dropping. And they just, they, I said, go, go. And then we seen all, Miss Gain, class, fell down. And we, when the little girl got up, the, le the leg was almost falling off. He parked his, his car just on the other side of that fence, lit it on fire, and he actually came in uh, through that, that gate. Do you remember being interviewed in the hospital I that did. evening? And I was sitting on my couch. This is hard. <laughs> I was sitting on my couch and you said I was shot here and I was shot in my foot and I just bellowed out to my husband. I knew about his foot, but I didn't know about the chest. That upset me so much that I had missed that. Well, it shouldn't because you did a, a great job that day. You, I know. You did, what, you did what you knew how to do and you, you took care of business, you know, and so I'm proud of you. I don't know Thank if anybody's you. ever told you that, but I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so. yeah, it's hard. Nobody had any training back then. The thing that went through my mind, I can't die right now because my mom's not here. My family's not here with me. Hysterical parents and relatives poured onto the school campus in frantic search of their children, brothers, and sisters. If you don't see your child here, go over to the main cafeteria. There are more children over there. Outside the church, emergency workers read names from a list of more than 30 students injured in the gunfire. Okay, are one of these your child? Get on my Which one? But for parents who could not find their children and whose names were not on the list, the tragic news came here by mid-afternoon at the school office. Several parents of the students killed had to be taken away by ambulance. Rathnar Orr, the nine-year-old third grader, was the only boy killed by gunfire Tuesday. Six-year-old Thoy Tran was student of the week in September. Eight-year-old Oim Lim was one of the most popular girls at Cleveland Elementary School. Six-year-old So Keen Man loved school. All she wanted to do was go to school. Eight-year-old Ram Chun, according to her older brother, was a smart little girl in school and very helpful at home. She's take care of my parents, she know how to wash dishes. We were about 70% Southeast Asian at the time uh, with our student population. And those families, you know, a lot of them had, had escaped the killing fields of Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge, and Vietnam. And they came here as refugees to escape what was going on in their home countries, and they come here to be safe. I feel like the war is still going on. Follow us all the way that we go. Anywhere we go, we still have a, a war with us. After the break, who was the shooter? and teachers relived the moments just days after the shooting. We watched his shadow cross over from our room over to the other side of the class of the building. Patrick Purdy led a life of a loner, a drifter. He attempted suicide in the past. Because he was very quiet, never talked to anyone and he was holding it inside, whatever was going on. And it came to a head. He didn't leave us a message or the note. 
and without that, we'll never know exactly why he did what he did. So far, no one has revealed what's behind the references to terrorism. Words like Hezbollah, victory, and PLO etched on Purdy's weapons and clothing. And into the year, we would find, you know, casings in the supply cupboards. I was in disbelief because who would shoot children and why? School officials say about two-thirds of the student body braved thick fog and their worst fears to return to their classrooms. For most, it was the first time back since Tuesday's bloody rampage. Awesome. Holes in the wall, blood on the wall, and um, uh, kids on the ground. Even her mother was reluctant. I don't know if I should leave her in school. You think it's just too soon? I think so. Coming to work the next day, talk about what that was like. That was almost as bad as the day it happened. I was so overwhelmed. I didn't feel safe anywhere anymore because the bullets could go through my wall. I wanted to be with my colleagues. You know, other people had been through the same thing, but I didn't want any children in my room. One of the changes that I made was I never pulled one of my students aside to talk to them about their behavior when it was time for them to go out for recess or to go to lunch or to go home for the day. I never wanted a harsh word or a message to be part of them leaving me, the last thing they would remember. Cleveland elementary teachers relived dark moments from the shooting just days later. I opened the door and here's Mr. Graham. He pushed that um, third grade boy, uh, I think it was Brandon. He was bleeding so hard. We watched his shadow cross over from our room over to the other side of the class of the building. And I, at that time, stood up and locked the door, only praying that he would think that we were out at recess as well. Even after he shot himself, we still had the terror. I could barely get myself to stand up. And the the six-year-old Rob uh, comes back to life, I feel. The feeling of vulnerability, the feeling of um, just being scared. It, it robbed me of that innocence of being invincible. It was because I had friends that were killed that day. I watched a lot of people have some pretty significant wounds that day. Is it like seeing your old classroom again? I have no wish to go inside ever again. So I do have PTSD um, and panic disorder. It's something I, that I've learned to live with. It's never going to go away. Sometimes it feels like it was yesterday. And other times it feels like in some other life. And I still, you know, I just don't understand. This person wanted to kill himself. Well, why do you have to take all these children with you? I mean, I don't understand. I have PTSD. Yesterday, I was preparing myself emotionally for this, for this interview. Especially after the shooting, I'm very uncomfortable if I can't see out. If I go into a restaurant, I try to choose the door, that, the chair that faces the door, that kind of thing. And I think that it's from being in that room. Still ahead, surviving this shooting is one thing. Living with the trauma decades later is another. We'll show you how these survivors turned a painful tragedy into action how frustrating it is 34 years later these incidents are still happening about 300 concerned parents teachers and school officials crowded into cleveland elementary school there's mixed feelings about whether beefed up security will help this man was sick we all know that but had he seen security guards here the security could have got to him before he killed five children there's good in the world and there's evil in the world and the good can only do so much and the evil can do a lot after the shooting state assembly members passed the roberti roos assault weapons control act of 1989 and it makes sense not to be able to sell assault rifles in our state 
The California assault weapons ban was the first in the nation legislative restriction on assault weapons and served as a model for the U.S. assault weapons ban passed by Congress in 1994. The federal law expired in 2004. Today, California's assault weapons ban remains uncertain. A big focus of my life since the shooting has been trying to get people to understand why we are determined to reduce the incidences like this. Adrian and Barbara are members of the nonprofit Cleveland School Remembers. The organization promotes gun safety and advocates for legislation. It makes me feel very angry. Um, it makes me feel like giving up. What does it take to have better gun laws? Rob dedicated the last 20 years of his career to law enforcement, beginning his career as a Stockton Unified School District police officer. And I was always proud to come back and really serve in that capacity. Everybody always asks, you know, did the shooting really push you towards that career choice? And it definitely strengthened it. I'm a product of this district. I'm a product of this school. I'm a product of this community. I've never blame the gun. I don't think that banning, you know, certain platforms is really going to stop anything. I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Salvador spent more than 30 years with the California Highway Patrol before starting his own company, TACMED Services. He teaches tactical medicine and active shooter training. Put the gun down! So much of the training that, that occurs today is lecture based. And so that makes it very difficult for an officer to actually understand what the feel of, of an active shooter event is. So my course is scenario based. It gives me hope when I see people take the class because I want, I want people to be safe. I have grandchildren and I worry about them. I don't want people to forget. I've always been afraid that if we stop talking about it, that my friends who were killed, that we're gonna forget their memory. I don't wanna let that happen. You know, their lives mattered. The students that came back to school, they did save me. Um, they kept, kept me coming back day after day. I have always told people that I believe six-year-olds are the smartest people in the world. Since 2013, there were at least 1,092 incidents of gunfire on school grounds across the country. More than 360 people have died. After the break, from the parking lot to the hallways, school campuses are rethinking safety measures. We take you inside a brand new school who says that there's a new generation of school safety. School campuses like Cleveland Elementary have been the backdrop of horrific scenes of gun violence for the last three decades. Day after day, devastated families and communities are grieving and trying to build a safer future. It's changing the way schools are run and built, like this brand new school in Vacaville. They're not taking any chances. Here's a look at the new generation of school safety. Parents are trusting to drop off their kids with us and that we're gonna return their kids to them in the same condition in which they left us. If you don't have safety, then you're not gonna be able to have an environment where people wanna send their kids to your school. It will unlock that door. Alarm system, card access, this is all alarm.com. So this controls the entire school and all the doors in it. We have the cameras with the license plate readers. We're capturing everyone's license plate that comes through here. The facial recognition, you can go to people and it will populate all the people that it has captured. So I can go to this particular person and it will populate every single time that person has gone by a camera. Each of our workshop spaces have panic buttons. If there's ever an issue in any one workshop space, all they have to do is lift this up and hit the button and it locks the facility down and begins to notify the police. So on our phones, we can literally push active intruder and it's gonna send an alert to every single person on the phone as well as our intercom system and then that sends law enforcement immediately to our direction. But I would say what really changed everything was the ball day. The suspected 18 year old shooter went inside Robb Elementary School. What happened in Uvalde was a horrific act of evil. The kids, they're getting the kids out. Officials are now reaching out to parents as quickly as they can. You know, as a parent, it's heartbreaking. It's like, what can we train the kids for? We have to train them to run, find a trusted adult, 
it's really hard as a parent to say, I have to say that to my five-year-old or my four-year-old and then hope that they get it. So we may never know if any of these measures were worth it, but we also may never know how many potential acts of violence they detoured because of the steps we were willing to take and the investment we were willing to make. We begin tonight with the deadly shooting at Michigan State. A shooting at a high school in New Mexico. A school shooting. A deadly massacre. So what will save us? For these survivors of the Cleveland school shooting, they're not giving up.